Hi, I'm David, and I'm worshiping with you from High Rock Haverhill. Today's reading from the Word of God can be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 18. Please follow along with me in your own Bibles or listen as I read the scriptures. Once again, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 18. Following the reading, I invite you to respond in worship with the singing of the doxology. Hear the word of the Lord. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Good morning, High Rock. My name is Allie, and I'm the Kids Rock Director at High Rock North Shore. And my name is Katie, and I'm the Kids Rock Director at High Rock Haverhill. We're so excited to be spending this Easter Sunday morning with all of you. Over the past couple of weeks, we asked our Kids Rock friends to help us out with something. We showed them this picture of a caterpillar, a chrysalis, and a butterfly. And we asked them to respond to the question, what is happening inside the chrysalis? Let's take a look at what they came up with. Hi, what happens inside a chrysalis? So a caterpillar, it's a stick, it's like a stick, but it's round and it's alive. A caterpillar um, loses its segments and then um, each segment, it, with each segment, um, its wings grow bigger. But like the more it loses its segments, um, the smaller it gets and the more it changes color, but I don't know why it changes its color. Maybe like growing wings or something? And maybe getting skinnier? It's growing wings. It's growing wings. And it's changing colors. And it's changing colors. The wind will blow him. The wind. Yeah. It will shake the chrysalis. And then it might turn into a butterfly. Blue. 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 Yellow. Yellow. Dots. Dot. Honey couple. Honey huh? couple. Oh, good time, my bugger. Happy bugger. Happy bugger. Yeah. Um, it's been to go to the ball and wings and the body and head and eyes and then mouth 
and then this. Tree. It turns into a tree? Yes. Oh, inside? Yeah. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Now then it turns into a butterfly tree. Yes. Oh. It gets smaller. It gets antennas. And then it goes wings. I really don't know. It eats food and then it... And then it makes a chrysalis because it's smushed, and then it it gets wings and heads and a body and four wings and and four stretchy things, and it hops out to a butterfly and flies away. It takes a long, long time, like I think ten days. And then it's going to grow the wings in the next month. Well, I think he's sleeping and growing wings. I think it starts changing colors and then grows in ten, and then it first grows in ten, and then the wings. So he eats a lot inside. Uh-huh. And oh. then? And then he gets tired. He gets tired? Uh-huh. Comfortable? Comfy. Nap. Taking a nap. Maybe a little weird. Weird. Probably very squished up. Squished. Maybe a little bit soggy. <laughs> <laughs> he has a bedroom, an attic, a basement, toys, a kitchen, a living room, a, a caterpillar. It goes through a change or a transformation inside a chrysalis and goes and gets longer and thinner with wings. Uh -huh. and the caterpillar changes into a butterfly. When it comes out when 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 the, when 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 um when when the caterpillar comes out the chrysalis it turns into a beautiful butterfly. And then it's a butterfly. Him turn I can't wait to be a butterfly. Those are some great ideas. You are all right. There's a lot of change happening inside the chrysalis. But how do all those changes happen? At the beginning of its life, a caterpillar eats a lot. That's all a caterpillar does. It eats and eats and eats. It's a very hungry caterpillar. It needs a lot of energy for all those changes that are about to happen. Then it makes itself a chrysalis, a hard shell around its body. And then it waits, and waits some more. So what's happening while it waits inside that hard shell? What is our friend, the caterpillar, doing in there? Well. It turns out that our caterpillar has turned into goo. That's right, the entire caterpillar's body dissolves into a sticky liquid. Days, even weeks go by. Slowly, the goo reorganizes and reforms into wings and legs, a mouth, a body, antenna, and voila! The caterpillar has transformed and comes out of the chrysalis as a beautiful butterfly. Caterpillars aren't the only things that can transform into something new. We can transform too. The Bible says that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. When you trust Jesus, you're still you. You keep the unique parts of you that make you who God created you to be. But a new life has emerged inside of you. And that new life is Jesus alive in you. And it's a beautiful, powerful, amazing life that will never, ever die. That's what Easter is all about. Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead so that we could have new life. And now we get to live as brighter, freer versions of ourselves. Now, Pastor Bryn and Pastor Matt are going to share more about how the butterfly symbolizes the new life at work in us. Good morning. I'm Matt. I'm the lead pastor of High Rock Haverhill. And I'm Bryn. I'm the lead pastor at High Rock North Shore. And it is great to be with you this Easter morning. That story of the caterpillar is pretty amazing, isn't it? Seriously. 
A kind of gross worm with short, squatty legs becomes like a colorful, beautiful creature that can fly. Right? It's amazing. But... But... What do you think that the caterpillar thinks of this whole thing? Like, the caterpillar has no idea. It can't even imagine what it's going to become. And I bet that if you presented this whole process to the caterpillar ahead of time, like if a caterpillar could understand human language and rational thought, and you talk to the caterpillar and you said, okay, so caterpillar, this is going to be great. You are about to get very hungry. And then you're going to eat a lot. That's not so bad. I like eating. And then you're going to get all wrapped up in a skin-tight sleeping bag and not be able to move for weeks. Okay, that's starting to get a little weird. And then you're going to turn into soup. Uh, that's just not right. And then you'll crawl out of the sleeping bag, and then you'll eat the sleeping bag. Mm-mm. And, mm -mm. <laughs> and after that, you are going to have a totally different body. And you're going to think totally different thoughts. And you'll even have these new appendices attached to your back that you didn't have before. I draw the line at new appendices. All the while. You had no idea what was happening to you or why. Yeah, I would not be interested in that if I was a caterpillar. Like, we only think that the metamorphosis of a butterfly is amazing because we've seen the after photos. We know what's on the other side of the chrysalis. But the caterpillar? It literally has no idea what's happening to it. And the caterpillar is subconsciously so afraid of the transformation that its cells resist the change. It tries to stay the same. It sabotages its own metamorphosis to cling onto its little wormy caterpillary life. So I'll be honest, because this is church, and we can be honest here at church, right? So from someone who likes to hold on to my own caterpillar, caterpillary life a lot of the time, to me, the process of transforming into something else, into the person that God intends me to be, that doesn't always seem worth it to me. Now, don't get me wrong. There is so much in my life and in my heart that I wish would change. There's so much in the world that I wish would change. And I hear these promises in Scripture that God brings new life, that God makes all things new, that Christ is reconciling all things to himself. And that sounds amazing to me. But then when you tell me about the journey to get there, yeah, I don't know about that. I just want things to, to change. But I don't want to go through the process of actually changing. And yet, this is the pattern that we've seen over the past six weeks in the final 24 hours before Jesus' death on the cross. Every moment in this journey invites us to follow Jesus towards transformation, but that transformation requires a death. Death. Death to our own way of comfort. Death to the ways we beat ourselves up. Death to the identities that we've built for ourselves. Death to our own definitions of success or power, or even family. Death to our habits, our tendencies that hurt others or hurt ourselves. Death to the sinful systems of the world that we don't want to believe that we're a part of. Death to sin, death to shame. Jesus said that to gain our lives, we'd have to lose them. He said that following him involved picking up our crosses and dying to ourselves. If we can't see past the death to the transformation that's on the other side, it's so easy for us to say, nope, hard pass, not for me. I'm not walking into that kind of pain. I'll stay the way I am. I'm okay being a caterpillar. But still, we know something's off in the world, don't we? And we long for it to change. The verses we heard this morning talk about being pressed on every side, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. These words could be a tagline for the world right now. We have felt pressure from every side. We have felt cast down and beaten up, and we long for change. Some of that longing comes from outside ourselves, from the way the world just is right now. Pandemics and violence and division and oppression. And some of our longing for change comes from inside ourselves. We want transformation in our homes and our hearts and our relationships, our bodies. We want to change the way that our brains work. The world around us and the world inside of us can feel like it's disintegrating into goop. We long for the other side of things. But we don't know what's on the other side of things. I imagine those who followed Jesus felt a similar kind of disorientation and despair when Jesus was crucified. They couldn't see, they couldn't imagine that there was anything good on the other side of the cross. How could the disciples have ever imagined that this man that they had followed for years could ever come back to life? How could they have ever imagined his invitation for them to join him there, to carry their own crosses, and to die with him too? 
But then, Easter morning. A transformation that makes a butterfly pale by comparison. Jesus showed up to his disciples alive and at large on the other side of death to be with them, to talk with them, to eat with them, to show them a different way to live in this life and in the next. What had seemed a nightmare on Friday became a miracle by Sunday, a fulfilled promise, a new and radiant hope. All of a sudden, these people could see how the story would go beyond the goop of their world as it was right then. They could see past the death part of the journey, that there was something worth dying for on the other side. On the other side of the cross and the empty tomb, the people of God had a different purpose, a different hope, a different perspective on the world, a different power that flowed through their whole beings. The Apostle Paul hadn't known Jesus before he died on the cross, but he met the resurrected Jesus and Jesus changed his life too. And he wrote the words that David read for us this morning. He said this, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. We are pressed on every side, yes, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but we don't despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. We are in this skin-tight sleeping bag being turned into goop, and at the same time, we don't have to be afraid of or resist that process. Why? Because. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus. Today, we can celebrate that death is not the end. Resurrection is on the other side of all the deaths that we face in this life. Death to our sin, death to our shame, death to our physical selves, death to the parts of our community and country and world that aren't surrendered to Jesus. And when we follow Jesus into those deaths, he offers us a different kind of life on the other side. The only kind of life that will last into eternity. So when we doubt this whole process, when this journey of transformation is hard or painful, when it feels like death, we can look at our resurrected Lord for a picture of what we will become. And when we look for him, we will see that new transforming life everywhere, in glimpses right now. We'll see it in our houses and apartments and dorm rooms, in our beds and at our dinner tables, and in the spot you're sitting in right now. We'll see it in the peppers growing in our gardens and in the children growing in our homes, and in the community growing in our churches. We'll see it in our plans and our prayers, in the tiny moments of hope and courage and love and forgiveness that emerge from what before felt impossible. So what is it in you? What in you needs this kind of resurrection transformation? And what in our world needs new life, new life that you could be part of? You know what the word for transformation is in scripture? Metamorphe. Metamorphe is the root word for metamorphosis. All those places in the Bible where we see Jesus being transfigured into his eternal heavenly reality, all the parts in the Bible where his disciples get transformed into people who look and act and think like him, the word in scripture for that transformation is the root word for metamorphosis. The exact same word that we use to describe how a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. And here's the good news. Eventually, this idea of death into new life that felt so unfamiliar and scary sometimes, at last, it'll start to reshape us, start to define us, start to become the most familiar thing in the world, almost like we were made for it. Exactly like we were made for it. And here's the best part. The good news doesn't stop with us. New life doesn't stop with your transformation or with my transformation. It's intended to radiate outward, multiplying and bringing more and more new life all over the world. Paul wrote this. He said, all this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Perhaps the best way to get a glimpse of what it looks like for thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God, of what it looks like to emerge from death and into life on the other side, is to hear from someone who has experienced what that was like firsthand. I remember a year ago getting the call that high rocker San Marino had COVID. He was admitted to the hospital the day before Easter last year on Holy Saturday. And we all believed and we were all told by his doctors that he would likely face his death that week. But on this Resurrection Sunday, a year later, Sam is still here, 
And he's going to tell us about how Jesus brought him new life, even in the face of death. I'm pretty sure the day was March 28th. I became aware, I, I think I have some of these symptoms, because I really started coughing real bad, and I was having difficulty breathing. And we were learning more about COVID, about people who were uh, more prone, the older people, which I'm 76 years old now. And I also had underlying health conditions. I'm a cancer patient. I also have one lung. They arranged me to have to be tested. I had to go to Danvers to get a swab. They recommended going right up to the hospital immediately. So we went there. I, and uh, when we got to Beverly Emergency, people were lined up outside. And I remember them putting me in a wheelchair. And from that point on, from that day, April 11th, I, I think I was pretty much put into the critical care unit. I was there six to seven weeks. And most of that time I was out of it. I know they had to strap me down. They, uh, I was on a ventilator. I guess I was having such difficulty breathing, you know, uh, that they had to put a tube in here and uh, in my throat, you know, through my throat so I could breathe. And uh, between that and the ventilator and oxygen and feeding tubes, uh, there were a lot of tubes, I guess. I learned later from my wife after I got out of the rehab that the doctors were asking her, her if, I, you want to do not resuscitate on, on me, you know, and she wanted to discuss it with my children and family. And, uh, you know, she, they went through an awful lot, you know, sometimes the ventilator was helping, sometimes it wasn't, uh, she was getting some different reports, you know, um, but eventually I, I, I was able to, uh, go to, a regular unit uh, after uh, roughly six to seven weeks. So anyway, when I was in the, in the regular unit, a, a nurse came over, introduced herself, and she said her name was Rachel. And she said, uh, I go to High Rock. And, uh, and I, I was like ecstatic. I don't know if that's the right word, but it put a smile on my face because like I had already mentioned, I, I had little contact with family or anything like that. And I also uh, had lost my voice for quite a while. And I think by the, when Rachel came and introduced herself, uh, I might have gotten most of my voice back. And I remember saying, hallelujah, you know, uh, she asked, told me if I wanted to attend church, she had a device on which I could watch it. And so it was on the 24th, I believe, of April that she came over and I got to go to High Rock with, you know, my church family. And uh, it was just great, you know, and uh, and I wasn't I was probably in the regular unit roughly 10 days. And uh, and then I had to get shipped over to a rehab uh uh, which I was there about five weeks. They had like a, a room and, uh, you know, you could watch TV. You got to meet a few other patients. A few, they were all like around my age, you know, definitely senior citizens. And they started to talk about music, which I always had a love for. And uh, so I got to share some Christian music with, uh, with them over that Alexa, you know, and I, I did have my wife send my Bible up also during that time. And I get to, to read. And I also, while I was there, started to get a lot of cards and things from people from the church and other friends. And, and I know I had a tremendous amount of prayers that were being said for me. And, and I really, I really feel like God was with me through that whole journey. And, um, and, uh, you know, I think of Hebrews, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I felt that, I, and I've always loved that verse of scripture. And through a lot of my other experience medically, uh, 
I, I have always felt uh, what I call, and I people can think what they want, that there's been holy presence around me. And I, like I said, I've had a lung removed. I've had, I have non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, and they're, the doctors and nurses especially have been like angels, you know, and I, God has gotten me through. He's blessed me so much. It, 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 I, I don't think there are enough words that I could say. And uh, in another verse of scripture that I, think of often is from Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And verses of scripture plug into me a lot and uh, they always have. And, uh, and when I came home, finally, uh, you know, after about three months being away, uh, it was, uh, it felt so good to be back home, you know, and, uh, you know, it was, it was just like amazing, you know. I'm so happy that I'm here this Easter and uh, consciously. And Easter has always meant, I, I think about the journey Jesus had to go through. What I went through was nothing compared to what my Lord and Savior went through for us, but it, it does mean so much this year and, and every year. And uh, I just would like to tell people to just trust God, you know, trust God. He loves us. He, he made a sacrifice. They made us, what he gave us is what we couldn't even imagine what he must have went through to be, be for the because he loved us so much and loves us so much. I say that in the present tense. He so loved the world. John 3.16. I mean, that is real. I, I just hope people reflect on what why we have Easter, why we remember this day, that day. And you know, Jesus. He came back from the dead. And, and, and many times I think that I was, if I wasn't dead, I was real close. I mean, I, my wife was telling me they were calling her to make these decisions, whether to resuscitate and do not resuscitate or take off the off ventilators. And so I don't, I don't feel I ever lost heart. I, 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 I want to go where the Lord wants me, his will. And it's by the grace of God I am here, and that is what I feel. Like Sam, we can live in light of those truths more and more, so we don't have to be afraid of what we're becoming or the process of becoming it. And whenever we doubt that, we can look at Jesus. In Him, we have hope. Maybe this morning you're feeling pressed on every side or perplexed, or persecuted, or struck down. Maybe the whole world feels like that to you. In the midst of all of it, let us fix our eyes on not what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but Jesus is eternal. Or maybe this morning you're farther along in the becoming. You're able to live more confidently in the abundant life of Christ. Maybe you're able, like Sam, to give your life away to bring life to those around you. Whatever gets you fired up, whatever animates you to stand up and say no more, that's probably one of the broken places in our world where God is calling you to bring life and light. No matter where you are in the process of transformation, whether you're taking the very first steps today or you're well on your way to Calvary, Jesus is with you now and forever. His life is at work in you, and we can be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, we want to remind ourselves of, of this truth. So we wanted to close our service with a tangible reminder of the transformation underway by making origami butterflies. So in a few minutes, Sarah and Sophie from High Rock North Shore are going to show us how to make them. So make sure you stick around after the benediction. And then later today, we're going to invite you to add your butterfly to all of the others. If you're part of High Rock Haverhill, that will happen at my house today at 1 p.m.
If you're part of High Rock North Shore, we're going to have this big wooden cross set up outside on the steps of our church at 10 Dane Street in Beverly. And we would love for you to bring your origami butterfly over at some point today and affix it to the cross. Together, all of these butterflies symbolize the new life that is at work in us and our commitment to bringing Christ's life to transform the rest of the world too. And more than ever, may we learn to live into the generosity, compassion, and grace of Jesus. He is risen. He is risen indeed.